This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Grain PLC is an investment company with a focus on breakthrough innovative technologies, particularly within the healthcare and life sciences sector. Founded in 2007 and listed on the Aquas Exchange with the ticker KING, that's K-I-N-G. Well, joining us today to introduce the company and tell us a bit more about the activities and the investment case are Executive Directors Steve Winfield and David Levis. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your time today. How are you doing, Steve, first of all? Hi, Mark. Very well, thank you. How are you doing? Thank you very much. So, I mean, if we can just start off, uh, Steve, by perhaps getting a a bit of a high-level overview of the company. I understand you really are an investment company specialising in early-stage developments, uh, aiming to invest in and commercialise opportunities that promise attractive returns. So if you can perhaps give us the elevator pitch, what the company is all about to start us off. Yeah, so I joined in 2021. And since then, uh, we've done a sort of lot of clearing up of the legacy items that the business had. Um, so that took quite a while. Um, and as you can imagine, we see and screen a lot of different projects along the time. And uh, it's when you're down in Aquas and not got scores of cash, it can be challenging. Um, but we've seen many opportunities. We've evaluated many opportunities, uh, made a couple of investments. and. Uh, we're in good stead now for our, our next development. Okay, well, we'll talk about that next development in a moment, of course, announced today. Could we just perhaps get a refresh or a bit of a touch on some of the active investments at the moment? So you've got Fix It. Yes. And you've also got a stake, I think, in Oscillate PLC. So let's just talk about Fix It first of all. It's a social sciences and humanities sector, is it? Yeah, so Fix It is a innovative catheter securement device. So that market hasn't moved along in the last sort of 20 years. And it's founded by a surgeon that fits catheters for a living. And he thought, how can I do this better? And uh, came up with the concept sort of several years back in his shed and worked it up to what it is today with international patents. And they've just been awarded a a smart grant as well to take the the business forward. Uh, But we're very excited about that because there's nothing in the sector that does what this securement device does. And we believe that it's going to have a lot of upside. And we we got in very early and managed to capitalize a a very decent stake for the business at 20%. Um, So they're on their journey to make it regulated now, uh, which should be done in the next sort of 12 to 14 months. And then they'll be out in in the market distributing and hopefully selling the device in in big quantities or alternatively looking for an exit of the, the product itself. Okay, okay. So that will be sort of crystallizing from from your point of view, perhaps in the next sort of 12 months or so. Yeah, 12 to 18 months is our is our horizon. Okay, okay. And then Oscillate as well. That's another company, of course, who I have indeed interviewed uh, Steve Sherry on the stock box here, who are really yeah, a company who are sort of starting to turn themselves around. So what's the uh, investment uh, position with Oscillate from your point of view? Yeah, so I, well, I'm I'm no longer, but I was a director of Oscillate along with Steve and John. Um, So we went on a similar journey to what iGrade has gone on, which is screening lots and lots of projects. And we managed to do our hydrogen deal and that's all announced and in the market. So I've resigned, but Oscillate is powering on with that project. And we, we see a lot of upside in that. It's a very, very new space a lot of good big players in the industry. Bill Gates is investing heavily in it. And we believe that's one to watch. And we'll see okay. some good further upside from our initial investment, which is already up from where it was when we first went into Oscillate. Okay. And just a final thought on the business model. What's the sort of investment strategy? I mean, you look to take early positions, as you sort of alluded to on the, on the fix-it uh, side of things there. In innovative and, and new technologies, yeah. but I mean, what's what what yeah? What is the sort of strategy, the business case to 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 grow value? Yeah, the way Simon and I, the other director, look at this is, you know, we're not really interested in making small returns because we're not in that position. You know, we go hard in several areas and and want big big returns in order to deliver lots and lots of value to the shareholders. So we saw that in Fix It. 
we certainly see that with with David and and the new transaction that we're we're getting into now. So what what we tend to do is spot ideas and back people as well as the project okay. and people we feel can deliver on their ambitions and tasks ahead. Okay. Because for, for us, you know, with the small market cap we have, we want to ultimately build this into a multi-million pound business. And you don't do that by backing small things that could produce small returns. So our idea is to, you know, back people, back good projects, but ultimately ones that can deliver far multiple returns over and above from what the level we get in at. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I'll come back to you at the end for a few words, but you did, of course, mention David there, who, of course, was appointed recently. So, David Levis, another director, recently appointed. Hello, how are you? Very good. Thank you, Mark. I wonder if you could perhaps, David, just start us off by giving us a bit of a background of yourself and what attracted you to the role here. Uh, I, I, I started off in, um, actually, aircraft design uh, when I was younger. Uh, and that led me into corporate finance, um, where I was at BDO Story Haywood for a couple of years, and then KPMG corporate finance for five or six years. Uh, and whilst I was there, I came across an interesting technology um, which had spun out of ICI. And that was a very high temperature material uh, that we, they were using to make brake pads, brake discs. At that point, they were focusing mainly at Formula One. Um, I got some funding into that uh, company, Seed Capital, but then took it on to the OFEX market and they asked me to join the board uh, and, and uh, effectively run all their corporate side. It's very interesting. It's still going now. It's on AIM. Um, it was, we, we launched it on OFEX um, back in the day, OFEX when it existed. Um, and uh, it was a great success. It's still, you know, as I say, it's still going to this day. Okay. That led and me. Then... That led me into um, property, uh, and that ultimately led me into uh, renewables. So I've got a background in uh, energy from waste. We developed an energy from waste plant, okay. uh, which was sold out to um, a company in Charterhouse Square, um, large large um, uh, uh, in institutional investor. Um, we were then looking at solar and battery storage. Uh, I met a, a, a chap who's now a colleague uh, in GEM, a guy called Andy Brown, who's an expert in this field. And uh, he's got a 30-year track record of, um, of getting uh, grid connections, solar, battery, and gas peaking plants. And it was that that led us to um, to meet up with Steve and Simon at iGrain. They were very interested in the, the, um, the marketplace. They got some experience of it previously. They were looking for um, an investment in that area. And it just so happened at the time that we were looking to partner with a company that could help us grow and help us achieve some of our ambitions, which is to develop some of the sites that we've identified uh, into full um, battery storage operational sites. Okay, so yeah, it was a meeting of uh, minds, a meeting of time and uh, opportunity, it sounds like, in your appointment here, I presume. Yeah, dovetailing with the uh, announcement today, of course, with the, uh, the exclusive rights uh, to GEM Energy are there. Yes, exactly. Um, we, we've been working on this for a while now to get it into the right shape. Mm -hmm. And Steve and Simon uh, recognised straight away that uh, what we're doing is we're, we're meeting a need. It's a critical uh, issue that we don't just have in this country. We have it all over the world. And, and anyone who knows about renewable, uh, renewable energy understands that if the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you're not actually producing renewables. If you take solar and wind as being your two primary uh, contributors. Um, so we end up with situations where we don't, ha where we have energy being produced, but we're not using it. So middle of the night, middle of the day, uh, as we move away from carbon-based uh, energy production, so gas and coal, we have to make sure that we're not wasting that electricity that we would otherwise not be using. 
So this is where battery energy storage comes in. It's, a, it's critical infrastructure. So all that energy that we're not using at night and during the day, we can now save uh, by installing uh, uh, battery uh, storage facilities. And then we can re-export that en energy to the grid uh, during those times when we have peak usage. And to give a, 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 an understanding of just how big the requirement is, currently we've got about 1.4 gigawatts of battery storage installed in the UK, and the UK is a leader in this field. Um, we need about 13 or 14 gigawatts by 2030. So more than tenfold increase on what we've actually got uh, uh, delivering now. By 2050, we need over 50 gigawatts of storage capacity. And okay. the, the, the way we're um, you, you sort of operating our modern lives is what's the, the primary driver with this, the move to electric cars, uh, 5G uh, telecommunication devices use four times as much uh, power as 3G, more power on our computers, um, uh, cooking going to uh, electricity rather than gas, home heating going to electricity rather than gas. So we really do need to address this issue that we've got, whereby if we're producing renewable energy, which is the right way to go, we need to be saving it as much as we can and using all of it. Okay. So you see this as a growing trend then. I mean, could you perhaps try and just contextualise that, that number you gave? So 13 to 14 gigawatts in the next few years, 50 gigawatts of battery storage required by 2050. I mean, I'm thinking that probably households, can we compare to households? and Just, just to contextualise how much that is. Um, it, it's... It's a huge amount of, of batteries that we need to install. Um, we're talking probably in the region of 200 to 250 projects at minimum, at the absolute okay. minimum. So, th so there's some very, very big um, development needs to go on in this area. Okay. Now, there are projects that are coming through, um, yeah. but we have real specialism in making sure that we choose the right projects. So a lot of the projects that that um, that are coming through at the moment, there are cases when they will where they will not be able to be built because either the grid connections are too far off, or the um, uh, the, the locations are not right. So investors are, can be quite picky about where they invest their money when they want to develop these sites out. What we focus okay. on initially is identifying sites. Um, where we think we can get a, a good grid, uh, grid connection. We do a lot of research before we start spending money on these sites. We think we can get a good grid connection. We think we can get planning that won't be too challenging, so it's in the right location. And then it, once we've got those, then those sites can either be uh, disposed of to institutional investors who are looking for the long-term income streams, or we can choose, and this will be um, probably a road that will go down at some point in the future um, to develop those sites out ourselves. Okay. Now, the way these sites make money is that through a 24-hour period, there's peaks and troughs in the price of energy that, that's traded on the market. There are European-wide trading platforms where energy is traded every single day. Um, you try and buy a unit of electricity in the middle of the night, uh, that, you know, that's going to be produced in the middle of the night, and it's significantly cheaper than electricity that's uh, that's available uh, or produced during peak time. So if you can buy energy in the middle of the night and then store it till it's required either uh, first thing in the morning when we all turn our uh, kettles on or when we all come home in the evening and you can sell it then, then th there's that's arbitrage, uh, good arbitrage, and that's where... Uh, these energy traders can make money. So institutional investors are interested in, in that price difference, buying electricity at one price and selling at mm -hmm. another price. Yeah, okay, that, that makes perfect sense. So how does this fit in with iGrain then? So as part of the announcement, it talked about having the first right of refusal allowing iGrain yeah. to invest in GEMS projects as they progress to the ready-to-build stage. How does this sort of fit in? I mean, I, from listening to you there, I'm, I'm guessing that you bring the sort of the uh, the USP of site identification. You said it's quite can be quite complicated. Correct. 
and then what well, iGrain can effectively take a stake in individual projects and then Correct. decide to build them out later or indeed to sell them to investors. Absolutely. So we've partnered now uh, with iGrain. They're going to fund us through that stage of identifying the sites, um, bringing the sites through planning, getting the grid connection sorted out, getting any way leaves that we need, identifying um, site um, improvements that might be required. We're very excited about working with iGrain. They've got some uh, some very interesting projects uh, that they're already working on. Uh, they're very interested in uh, new uh, um, sectors where there's some longevity. Th this is a critical sector, and it's going to be a very exciting sector. There's going to be a lot uh, of activity over the next 20, 30 years um, different technologies, battery technology is moving forward hugely. The type of storage is moving forward. So when we're as well as the um, the short term, but relatively short term uh, value that we think we can bring to iGrain and its shareholders, we see that there's long term uh, opportunities here. We couldn't have achieved that uh, on our own. Uh, we need the initial support, uh, and it's going to allow us to really, really move uh, forward quite in a quite exciting way. The cost of developing those sites through planning, through grid connections, can be around anything, anywhere really from around £150,000 up to £250,000, £300,000, sometimes even more on the very, very big uh, megawatt sites. So iGrain are going to come in with us. They'll help us through that process. They'll provide funding to us to take us through that on an exclusive basis so we won't be working with anyone else. Um, okay. And then when we've got those sites uh, into a position where they are, are at that ready-to-build stage, uh, they become very valuable. And the, they become valuable because of this arbitrage that can be made uh, on the trading of electricity once they're built out. So at that point, we can choose either to sell them to institutional investors who will build them out and, and trade the energy, or at some point, future point, we can choose to develop those sites ourselves uh, and and move on to the next stage, which is as it would be as a site owner and an operator. Okay, okay. So just thinking on on sort of key milestones then in terms of site identification, potential starting to get planning permission or start building on site, and then getting of course sites online. Do you have a plan in mind as to sort of when you want to hit sort of sort of sort of key uh, key sort of stage gates? Yes, we, we do. So we have sites already that we've started working on. Uh, there's about four of them. Um, they, they, we've, we've done a significant amount of, of um, due diligence, bit of, uh, a bit of pre-deployment of cash uh, work. Okay. Um, we've, we've, we've got planning consultants looking at it. We've got a uh, grid connection with some large um, institu uh, uh, international um, advisors that we work with. We've identified... Uh, the the, the uh, locations uh, and we're now ready to move on about four sites. We should be right. able to take those through planning um, in the next. Well, the grid connection first, really, uh, in the next nine months. Planning will will start uh, straight away as well, but that'll take a little bit longer. So a, a site can come out of uh, of the end of the process in anywhere really from twelve months with if everything goes according to plan up to around two years if, it, uh, if, it, if it's taking a little bit longer. And when we get to the, the end of that process, we can have a position where the site could be worth anywhere from around £50,000, seventy, even £90,000 per megawatt of connection. So a spend to get, to get a site through that process of, let's say, £200,000 could net, could net um, a return to the company of anywhere between, say, six to nine million pounds, depending on uh, the characteristics of the site. So the upside to iGrain could be significant once we've got a few of these sites through the process. Well, Steve, if I can just come back and finish off with you. Of course, at the start, we talked about the company that it was founded in sort of 2007. And of course, you've got the existing uh, interests within the company here. But I'm just quite curious to understand a bit more about where the company is now. And perhaps, you know, now that you're sort of coming out, we're talking on here, you listed on Aquis there with a the market cap of circa 200,000. Is this a sort of 
is it fair to say a sort of turnaround point in the company as this new deal really a catalyst event? What's the sort of situation at the moment with the company going forward to, to build value really for shareholders existing and potentially new? Yeah, I think firstly, Mark, I think the current share price is is really undervalued for the business. If you look at even just our oscillate stake is worth 50% more today than the market cap that you just said. And along with our fix it stake is is worth, you know, considerably more than what we bought it at because they've had a grant and developed it further and they got more cash than the valuation that we came in at alone. So I think that that's the first thing. But this investment rights with Gem and David's team, I think since I joined, this is definitely the turning point. And there's no point shouting when you've not got a lot to shout about. But I think now is the time that we do. And we're going to go hard and fast into this new area with David and his team. Several projects, as David's noted, are ready to go now. So we'll be immediately getting onto those and, and deploying the necessary capital to move those forward. But also we're going to Simon and I's job is to bring vastly more capital into the business. And we can do that in the actual project SBVs and bring some non-dilutive family office syndicate cash in, which can bring forward projects on behalf or in collaboration with iGrain. So we can get as many of these projects running in parallel as possible. Because David touched on the sort of values that these projects are worth once they get to RTB is very considerable and it could be really, really exciting for for the business, David and and everyone else. So yeah, I think it's definitely a turning point. A turning point. And your job effectively is to get the funding in place for its project level SPV, as you say, so non-dilutive from potentially family officer syndicate, as you mentioned. You're effectively the yeah, the the responsible for that side of it, the money, the corporate side, and David responsible for the yeah, the execution, I guess, and the identification of the sites. Is that sort of fair to say? Yeah, we've got this this first facility, small facility that we've secured with Vela, who are a big supportive shareholder. So that will bring us forward over the next, you know, several months. But in parallel, that that's the goal, exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your time. Steve Winfield and David Levis, the executive directors of iGrain PLC. Looking forward to uh, yeah, diving a bit more, perhaps, with you, David, onto the, the concept here and uh, looking at some of the potential sites and, of course, catching up with you, Steve, on how you're going to execute this corporately. But for now, thank you very much, both, for your time. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like, or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.